Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast recording of the Old Testament. Although this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort's been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. I'll be using for the text the Joseph Smith translation of the Old Testament, along with many commentaries from general authorities of the Church, BYU professors, Bible scholars, and others. This format will be very detailed, and so if you want a deep analysis of the Old Testament, you come to the right place. Thanks for your attendance. Hi, and welcome to this podcast on the book of Genesis. I'm Brad Constantine, and this is chapter one of Genesis. Now, before I get into the actual scripture, I want to read a few introductory comments that uh, might help us get a, a framework for what this, uh, this is going to be all about. First of all, the accounts of the creation in the fall are the foundation for the temple endowment. Elder Packer said that. Also, the accounts of the creation in the fall is to show our relationship to God. Keeping in mind that uh, the three pillars of eternity, according to Elder Bruce R. McConkie, is the creation, the fall, and the atonement. Had there been no creation, there would have been no fall of Adam and Eve, and had there been no fall of Adam and Eve, there would be no atonement of Jesus Christ. And without the atonement of Jesus Christ, none of us would be able to return back to the presence of our Heavenly Father. Another interesting thing to keep in mind is that as we're going through the creation, especially in chapter 1, that uh, it's deliberate act by God, and it's also showing that God is good, and that everything that he creates is good. And at the very end of the creation, God announces that everything is very good. So let's get into this. Uh, first of all, a comment by Bruce R. McConkie. Our analysis properly begins with the frank recital that our knowledge about the creation is limited. We do not know the how and why and when of all things. Our finite limitations are such that we could not comprehend them if they were revealed to us in all their glory, fullness, and perfection. What has been revealed is that portion of the Lord's eternal word, which we must believe and understand if we are to envision the truth about the fall and the atonement and thus become heirs of salvation. This is all we are obligated to know in our day. And then uh, Kent Jackson said this, For our current needs, the Lord has given us the beautiful, powerful, concise, and systematic creation accounts of the scriptures. He has also given us collectively an intellectual curiosity that has opened the frontiers of science for the, better, for the betterment of all life. I believe that Latter-day Saints would do well to realize that it will not be until Christ comes again that the full story of God's creative act will be made known through revelation. In the meantime, we can learn to live with certain questions not yet answered, trusting that it is wisdom in God that not all things are made known in our day. Perhaps the most powerful message that is, that is contained in the Genesis creation account, and in the other accounts as well, is that the creation was a deliberate act of God. The scriptures leave no room for the idea that the existence of life on earth is accidental. We also learn from the Genesis account that the crowning achievement of the creation was man. So let's go ahead and get into this. Another thing I want to keep in mind is that um, as we're reading Genesis, I'm going to also be referring to Moses and the book of Abraham uh, because these uh, go along with the creation account as well. And each of them have a little bit different uh, viewpoint of the creation, a few different passages. Now, the book of Moses, chapter 2, is actually the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 1. So I'm going to read from Moses 2 because that's the Genesis, or that's the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 1. All right. Uh, if you want to open up your scriptures then to Moses chapter 2, because that's what I'm going to be reading from, uh, mostly at this point. And if you want to put a hand in um, Abraham chapter 4, we might be switching back and forth between the two. Uh, Moses chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, I reveal unto you concerning this heaven and this earth. Later on, he's going to tell Moses that uh, only an account of this earth is he going to give him. Um, he's not going to show him the other, what's going on on other planets, but uh, he'll know the goings and comings of this planet. Write the words which I speak. I am the beginning and the end, the Almighty God, by mine only begotten, I created these things. Yea, in the beginning I created the heaven and the earth upon which thou standest. And in the book of Abraham he says, And the Lord went, and the Lord said, Let us go down. That, and they went down at the beginning, and they, that is the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. 
So we know that the creative act was not just God doing this, but he also involved uh, Jesus Christ and others. And uh, I'll give you a quote later on, on on some of the feelings that we have about who else helped to create the world. Verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and I caused darkness to come upon the face of the deep, and my spirit moved upon the face of the water, for I am God. Now in the book of Abraham it says, And the earth after it was formed was empty and desolate, meaning there was nothing on it, because they had not formed anything but the earth. And darkness reigned upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of the gods was brooding or watching until they obeyed upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, And I, God, said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, in verse 4, And I, God, saw the light, and that light was good, and I, God, divided the light from the darkness. Now, what is where is this light coming from, and what's the source of the light? President John Taylor said, the gods causing the light of their glory to shine upon the earth before the sun appeared in the firmament. So this is about Heavenly Father's light being shined upon the earth. This isn't where the earth is put in, in a place where the sun would shine upon it, but this is God's light being shined upon it. Verse 5, And I, God, called the light day, and the, and the, day, and the darkness I called night. And this I did by the word of my power, and it was done as I spake, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, we don't know exactly how long a day lasts here. We can say that there are some alternatives, some alternative beliefs on how long that would be. The earth and firmament were organized in six periods of time. Officially, the church has not taken a stand on the age of the earth. According to three theories, the earth could have been created in six literal days. It could have been created in 6,000 years or six creative periods of indeterminate lengths of time. In my opinion, it seems like the latter is probably the most likely, that it was six creative periods of time. But as was mentioned by Brother Jackson in the beginning, uh, we'll know during the millennium probably uh, how all of this happened, and it'll be made known to us how long all of this, all of this took. Verse 6, And again I said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the water. And it was so, even as I spake, and I said, Let it divide the waters from the waters. In other words, the water in the clouds above the earth, from the waters on the earth, and it was done. Now, if you go back to the book of Abraham, you'll notice that uh, it mentions in verses 3, 4, and 5, and so on, it says, And they, the gods, said, Let there be light. And they, the gods, comprehended the light. Verse 5, And the gods called the light day and the darkness night. Verse 6, And the gods also said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and it shall divide the waters from the waters. So there's going to be an atmosphere, is what they're mentioning here. Firmament means expanse. The firmament of heaven is the expanse of heaven. It refers, depending upon the context, to either the atmospheric or the sidereal heavens, and that's where some of in the Mormon doctrine. The firmament is our atmosphere. Uh, verse 7, And I, God, Abraham says, and the gods, made the firmament and divided the waters, yea, the great waters under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, or the clouds in the sky. And it was so even as I spake. And uh, I like how it mentions in uh, Abraham, it says the gods ordered the expanse so that it divided the waters which were under the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so even as they ordered. Verse 8, And I, God, called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And in Abraham it says, And the gods called the expanse heaven. And it came to pass that it was from evening until morning, and they called night that they called night, and it came to pass that it was from morning until evening th that they called day, and this was the second time that they called night and day. Verse 9, And I, God, said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and it was so. And I, God, said, Let there be dry land, and it was so. So here we have the dividing of the land from the water, and that the ocean is in one place, and the land is in one place. From Joseph Fielding Smith, we read, From this we learn a marvelous fact, which very few have ever realized or believed in this benighted age. We learn that the waters, which are now divided into oceans, seas, and lakes, were then all covered into one vast ocean, and consequently that the land, which is now torn asunder and divided into continents and islands, almost innumerable, was then one vast continent or body, not separated as it now is. And that was a quote uh, 
that uh, Joseph Fielding Smith gave of Parley P. Pratt. Verse 10, And I, God, called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called I the sea. And I, God, saw that all things which I had made were good. Again, everything that God makes is good. 11, And I, God, said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit yielding fruit after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed should be in itself upon the earth. And it was so, even as I spake. And in, verse, and in Abraham it says, And the God said, Let us prepare the earth to bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed in itself yieldeth its own likeness upon the earth. And it was so even as they ordered. I think it's interesting as we uh, study the, the account of the creation that's uh, depicted in the temple. Uh, that it's a little bit different in the orders of the days, and there's some explicit language that mentions um, that when the seeds were put into the ground, that uh, that they were actually planted in the ground. Uh, the temple gives us a better understanding of that, that seeds were placed upon the earth, and uh, and that's that's where the uh, the the plants came from. Verse 12, And the earth brought forth grass, every herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed should be in itself after his kind. And I, God, saw that all things which I had made were good. Again, everything that God makes is good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Now, a little side note here. Um, it's interesting that in the third day, the good, the creation being good, is mentioned twice. In every other in every other day that it's mentioned, it's only mentioned once as being good. Interesting and traditionally for Jews, the third day of the week was a lucky day, because the good the word is good the word good is used twice on the third day more than any other day. Often in Jewish culture, um, weddings and other important events are occurred on the third day as a as a symbol of that that being a lucky day. So just an interesting side note. All right, day four, verse 14. And I, God, said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, it's interesting in the temple, it's a little bit different because this, the light of the sun and moon come before the seeds are planted, which would make sense because you'd have to have light to grow the plants in the first place. And so the Genesis account is a little bit different than what the temple version of it is. Verse 15, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. So here we have the earth being put into the solar system uh, with the sun, the moon, and the stars in their places. 16, and I, God, made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And the greater light was the sun and the lesser light was the moon. And the stars also were made even according to my word. And I, God, set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And in um, Abraham, it says, The God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to cause to divide the light from the darkness. So here it sounds like the earth is made to rotate so that there's a night and a day. Verse 18, And the sun to rule over the day and the moon to rule over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And I, God, saw that all things which I had made were good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Again, everything is good. Fifth day, uh, verse 20, And I, God, said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature. Now, in the temple version of this, um, the bringing forth of the of the plants is on the fourth day, and the bringing forth of all of the animals is on the fifth day. The fish and the mammals are all on the fifth day, which is different than what's here. This shows the the uh, fish and the water animals are brought forth on day five. Verse 20, and I, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl, which may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And I, God, created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And I, God, saw that all things which I had created were good. Now, in the in the Bible here, it mentions whales. Uh, in the Hebrew, the translation is actually great sea monsters. 
Um, I'll just read you from, a, from the Clark Bible Commentary. It says, the word whales used in this verse translates the Hebrew word tananim, which comes from the verb meaning to stretch and means the long stretched ones. This word probably applied to other large sea animals or reptiles, such as the dolphin, shark, and crocodile, besides the animal we actually call the whale. Verse 22, And I, God, bless them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Okay, now let's go to day six, which is the creation of animals and men. And I, God, said, or I should say animals and man, And I, God, said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. Now, I want you to notice here that when it mentions, let the earth bring forth these things, uh, the temple version of it is a little bit different. And it mentions that animals would be placed upon the earth, not created out of the earth or from uh, particles of the earth. The, the God actually placed animals upon the earth. And uh, we can get into a bigger discussion of that if you'd like. Verse 25, And I, God, made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything which creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And I, God, saw that all these things were good. I think the emphasis here, that the animals would be created after their kind, is trying to, not trying, it's doing a very good job of making sure that we understand that this is a creative process, and that this is not evolution that's causing these things to happen. That animals are created um, as animals and not from one living creature to another. Um, verse 26, And I, God, said unto mine only begotten, which was with me from the beginning, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And it was so. And I, God, said, let them have dominion over the fishes of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So man is going to be given dominion over everything. Now, Lorenzo Snow said, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. There will come a time for all mankind when the encounter with the Son of God will be literal. For the faithful and obedient, it will be a moment of glory and peace. For the disobedient and non-valiant, a moment of profound remorse. Uh, the priesthood was first given to Adam. He obtained the first presidency and held the keys. This is in discussion about his dominion over the earth held the keys of it from generation to generation. He obtained it in the creation. Before the world was formed, he had dominion given him over every living creature. He is Michael, the archangel, spoken of in the scriptures. Verse 27, And I, God, created man in mine own image, in the image of mine only begotten, created I him. Male and female, created I them. Now, from Brigham Young we read, uh, this word applies uh, spoke of man, he, this word applies to both male and female. Latter-day prophets have comment, commented on the existence of a mother in heaven. The first presidency in 1909 stated the following, All men and women are in the similitude of the universal father and mother, and are literally the sons and daughters of deity. Uh, and then again, the first presidency said, um, and Council of the Twelve of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints said, we solemnly pro proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of his children. And that's from the family of proclamation to the world. Joseph F. Smith said, I believe that the declaration made, I'm sorry, this is Brigham Young, I believe that the declaration made in these two scriptures is literally, literally true. God has made his children like himself to stand erect and has endowed them with intelligence and power and dominion over all his works and given them the same attributes which he himself possesses. He created man as we create our own children, for there is no other processor of creation in heaven, on the earth, in the earth, or under earth, or in all the eternities that is, that were, or that ever will be. Joseph F. Smith said, man was born of woman, Christ the Savior was born of woman, and God the Father was born of woman. Adam, our earthly parent, was also born of woman into this world, the same as Jesus and you and I. Verse 28, And I, God, blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. 
Adam and Eve were thus created last in order that they should rule over all creation and in order that they should be able to enter a banqueting hall that was waiting ready for them. That was from the Encyclopedia Judaica, Jr. Uh, also, uh, the Hebrew for replenish, um, replenish means to fill or make full. It doesn't mean to replenish like we understand it. Here's a quote. I have told many groups of young people that they should not postpone their marriage until they have acquired all of the education ambitions. I have told tens of thousands of young folks that, they, that when they marry, they should not wait for children until they have finished their schooling and financial desires. Marriage is basically for the family, and when people have found their proper companions, there should be no long delay. They should live together normally and let the children come. And that was President Kimball. Okay. Um, let me just read you another couple quotes here. Um, I, God, said unto mine only begotten, which was with me from the beginning, let us make man, not a separate man, but a complete man, which is husband and wife in our image, after our likeness, and it was so. What a beautiful partnership. Adam and Eve were married for eternity by the Lord. Such a marriage extends beyond the grave. All people should call for this kind of marriage. This is a partnership. Then when they had created them in the image of God, to them was given the eternal command, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And as they completed this magnificent creation, they looked it over and pronounced it good very good, something that isn't to be improved upon by our modern intellectuals. The male to till the ground, support the family, to give proper leadership, the woman to cooperate, to bear the children, and to rear and teach them. It was good, very good, and that's the way the Lord organized it. This wasn't an experiment. He knew what he was doing, and that's President Kimball. Verse 29. And I, God, said unto man, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which shall be the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat or food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein I grant life, there shall be given every clean herb for meat. And it was so, even as I spake. Verse 31. And I, God, saw everything that I had made, and behold, all things which I had made were very good in the evening and the morning or the sixth day. Now in Abraham, back in chapter 4, at the end of that chapter, verse 31, it says, And the gods said, We will do everything that we have said, and organize them, and behold, they shall be very obedient. And it came to pass that it was from evening until morning, they called night. And it came to pass that it was from morning until evening, that they called day, and they numbered the sixth time. And that's the end of chapter 1. I hope this was helpful in gaining a few insights. Um, I think the important thing here about the creation is that this was an act, a deliberate act of God, and that uh, we may have actually helped in the creation of the earth as part of our um, premortal activities before this earth was finished. And uh, I know that uh, animals were placed here. If you think about that, that animals also have a spirit and that they existed before, and that uh, offspring of eternal animals were brought to this earth. And uh, we'll have a, a discussion about that in another chapter, I'm sure. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, you can share, like, and, sh and uh, subscribe to this podcast. 